Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the OIB press conference where we will present the state of the world vine and wine sector of 2022, prepared by Giorgio Del Grosso and Majo Nakagawa from the Statistical Department and with the support of the Communications Department. The conference will be held in French, English, and Spanish. You have three options on the app to follow in the language you wish. You can now find the statistical documents on the app and you can start asking questions, which we will answer at the end. So, without further ado, I give the floor to the OAB Director General, Pau Roca. Bonjour et bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for your presence here today for our press conference, during which, as is the case each year, we will highlight the figures regarding the vitivinicultural sector in 2022, as well as some outlook for the future of the sector. And let's move on to the slides. In this presentation, I show the data for 2022 on vineyard surface areas, wine production, wine consumption, and international trade of wine. I will also briefly cover estimates for wine production in 2023 in the Southern Hemisphere countries. Lastly, I will conclude with some reflections on what the future of the sector beholds. So let's get started. Let's first look at the world's vineyard surface. In 2022, the total area of vineyards in the world accounts for 7.3 million hectares. The evolution of global vineyards seems to have stabilized since 2017. Two factors are mainly attributing to this stability. First, the growth of Chinese vineyards, which had accelerated in the early 2000s, it's slowing down. And second, the growth of the European Union vineyards, currently accounting for 46% of the world's total, has been capped since 2008 by an authorization system for new plantings. For the rest of the countries, we observe heterogeneous tendencies that balance out among themselves and lead to this stability in 2022. The distribution of vineyards shows the widespread presence of grape growing areas in many countries. However, as the pie charts in the right shows, the top six countries account for more than half of the world's viticultural areas. In Europe, these are Spain, France, and Italy. And outside Europe is China, Turkey, and the USA. Here's a closer look at trends over the past decade in major grape producing countries. Spain has the largest vineyard area in the world in 2022, but the vineyard area is declining. It is the same for Turkey, USA, and Argentina. On the contrary, in France, India, and Russia, they have experienced an increase in their vineyard surface areas. And countries such as China, Italy, Chile, and Australia have recorded stable surface. Now we're moving to much awaited estimates of wine production. World wine production in 2022 is estimated to be at 258 million hectoliters. In 2022, dry and hot conditions were observed across different regions of the world. This resulted in an earlier harvest and average volumes. As shown in this figure, global wine production remained stable for the fourth consecutive year. This is slightly below the 20 year average, which is around 270 million hectoliters. Let's look now at the world wine production distribution in 2021. As the map and pie chart shows, 
Italy, France, and Spain account for more than half of the wine produced in the world. And more than three quarters of the world production is accounted for by the top eight producers. For the major producing countries, the next slide gives a closer look at their production volumes and the percentage change from the previous year. The red bars show volume and the blue ones res uh, show respectively percentage changes over the previous year. Italy with 50 million hectoliters confirms to be the largest producer in the world. Among the top producers, Italy and Spain have remained relatively stable year over year. France, on the other hand, records an increase compared to 2021, which was because was one of the lowest production that year seen in the last few decades. New Zealand and Switzerland have seen ex exceptional high increases. The former, Switzerland, has a record high wine production level due to a mix of excellent climatic condition and high international demand. As for Switzerland, no, that was referred to New Zealand. As for Switzerland, it records a 63% higher than the extremely low volume for 2021. The head waves experienced across Europe were beneficial for Swiss uh, being at relatively high altitudes. In contrast, other countries such as China, Romania, Australia, and Greece saw significant declines. As you know, Chinese wine production has been declining for the last decade. Its wine production level in 2022 is estimated to reach 4.2 million hectoliters, marking a reduction of almost 30% compared to the previous year. Let's take a look at now at uh, wine consumption. World wine consumption in 2022 is estimated at two, 232 million hectoliters. Starting in 2018, global wine consumption has decreased at a regular rate. Declining demand in China has a significant impact on this global negative trend. Nevertheless, in 2021, most countries experienced an increase in consumption due to the uplifting of restrictions caused by COVID-19 pandemic. However, in 2022, the war in Ukraine and the associated energy crisis, together with the global supply chain disruptions, led to a spike in costs in production and distribution. This resulted in significant increases in wine prices for consumers. In such a context, wine consumption behaviors at the country level have been quite heterogeneous across geographical regions. As for the distribution and consum of, of consumption, mm -hmm. the map and the pie chart shows that it is more dispersed than the surface area production. Nevertheless, the top 10 countries account for 70% of world consumption. The EU represents 48% of the total. This share has significantly decreased since 2000, when it was estimated at almost 60% of the world's total. The next slide shows the main consuming countries. The consumption volume is shown in orange, and the year-over-year -year percentage change is in blue. USA continues to be the largest wine consumers in the world, with a volume estimated at three, at 34 million hectoliters. This indicates that consumption volume has returned to the pre-pandemic level. China, Brazil, and Belgium show large negative rates of change. In the last five years, China has cut its consumption by half. On the contrary, Portugal and South Africa show large increases, especially for South Africa, this level is the highest consumption level ever recorded. Top wine consumers that are above 2 million uh, hectoliters are presented here 
with data on, on both total consumption on the left side and in per capita terms shown in the right side. Portugal has the highest consumption per capita of about 68 liters. France and Italy are the second and third largest consumer countries per capita. It is important to remind that statistics on wine consumption <coughs> in aggregate terms, as we show here, should be interpreted with, the, with a lot of caution because many qualitative aspects of wine consumption behavior, such as frequency of consumption, share of drinking population, share of tourist consumption, and other factors cannot be fully captured under this data. However, such data can be useful to estimate the potential for market growth. Now let's move to a very interesting and relevant topic, given its evolving dynamics, which is international trade. As previously mentioned in the consumption, wine exports also were impacted by price increases and supply chain disruptions in 2022, which were caused again by the war of Ukraine and subsequent energy crisis leading to a slowdown in sea freight. This combination of events resulted in an overall lower volume of wine exported at a much higher average price with global wine export value estimated at almost 38 billion euros. And this is the highest figure ever recorded in foreign trade, in ex external exchanges. So I think we have a record this year. A detailed breakdown of international trade is presented in the next slide. Of all categories, bottled wine accounts for the largest share of the total, both in terms of volume and value. Overall bottled wine export was, has, a, has a decrease of 4% in volume, but an increase of 7% in value compared to 2021. Sparkling wine has seen a very positive performance last year. It was the only category <coughs> that sees an increase both in volume and in value, up to 5% and 18% respectively. Let's now look at the year-over-year -year comparisons for the main exporting countries in terms of volume and value. The international trade of wine is dominated by three countries, three European main mm -hmm. of the European main, uh, Union. This is Italy, Spain, and France, which together exported 57 million hectoliters in 2022, accounting for 53% of the world wine exports. In terms of volume, shown at the top, these three countries have all declined with respect to 2021, although to different degrees. Among the top countries, only Australia and New Zealand show an increase. In contracts, as you can see in the bottom, all major countries show a rise in value. The increase is particularly high in France and Italy, whose exports were worth about 2 billion, 2 billion euros more than 2021. Regarding imports, the USA, Germany, and the UK are the top three countries in 2022. Together, these three countries account for nearly 40% of the world's total. For the other countries, most of them have a negative variation compared to 2021 and can be seen at the top right. The largest decrease is in China, as we said, due to declining demand for bulk and bottled wine. But by contrast, in value terms, most countries have seen year-to-year -year, uh, gains. UK's, very interesting data here. UK's increase comes from all categories, but it is worth noting the increase in value 
of sparkling wine that recorded 41% over 2021. Now we are looking at the indicator that the OIV keeps an eye to see how the market is international, internationalized. That is the market international, internationalization index. It is the ratio between world wine exports and consumption. It shows that in 2022, 46% of wine consumed, world wine was imported. This is a signal that the wine market continues to be highly globalized. As you can see, this index shows a market upward trend since the beginning of the century. Now we move to the forecast of the Southern Hemisphere. This data on wine production in 2023, so the present year, is naturally very preliminary estimation. It should be taken with a lot of caution. Overall, we anticipate a decline in wine production for 2023 in all the Southern Hemisphere. Argentina estimates a 21% drop. This is due to the occurrence of late frost and hailstorms. In addition to the water shortages to the, that have been repeated this year, the decline is even greater for Brazil. This is 30%. Despite the wildfires that had hit a few regions in Chile this year, uh, we expect a harvest in line with the previous year. In Australia, a 13% decline is expected due to the seasonal factors and again, widespread flooding. In New Zealand, 2023 harvests are likely to return to average volumes. Finally, in South Africa, the production level in 2023 is expected to be at 9.5 million hectoliters, which is lower than its last five year average. This is a result of hail, the presence of powdery mildew, and sunburn from the heat spikes. This is for the 2022 figures. Now I switch to Spanish to deliver you some thoughts on the sector and the main challenging challenges that I think we're facing. As we had anticipated at the time of our last press conference in October 2022, this has been a very challenging period for the world wine and vine sector. And this is probably going to be the case for the 2023 outlook as well. The Ukraine uh, war continues to cast a shadow on the world economy. According to the OECD, despite uh, the uh, recent uh, signs of improvement, we expect that the recovery in the uh, coming two years will be uh, very moderate. The great uncertainty generated by the war is having a considerable cost on the economy. The commercial tensions are great and could worse. Recently, these have been increased by concerns regarding financial vulnerability, the uh, real estate markets, and also the instability in the countries of the lowest incomes. And at the same time, even if world inflation has con started to decrease in the first quarter of 2023, it continues to be high. World growth slowed down in 2022 down to 3.2 percent. This is one percentage point lower than was expected at the end of 2021. And this was as mainly affected by the war in Ukraine and by the increase in the cost of life. We have also seen uh, that growth has been under the 2023-2024 projections, and this despite the reopening of China, which took place more rapidly than was initially uh, thought of. According to the IMF, the world inflation in 2022 was 8.8% .8 and is expected to be around 6.6% in 2023 and 43 
in 2024, and this is above levels seen prior to the pandemic, that when inflation was around 3.5 percent. And we can see, in other words, that we are have an economy which is characterized by inflation, which has reached a maximum point when growth is at the lowest point. And when we see the lowest economic growth. According to the analysts, the main problems for this sector in 2022 can be characterized by the increase of costs, whether it be for energy, glass, paper, logistics. And if, and if we take into account that this is probably the main source of concern for companies. For example, glass bottles in the United States have increased by about 20 percent. In Italy, uh, the average increase was near 35 percent. And due to the tensions in, in terms of energy and raw material prices, today a bottle, a glass bottle costs 30 percent more than in 2021, while the price of corks has increased by more than 20 percent. As far as the sparkling wines are concerned, the, uh, why, the metal wires have increased by 20 percent. Labels have increased by 35 percent, and cardboard boxes by 45 percent. And this is the reality faced by, in terms of inputs. The distortions provoked by the supply chain uh, disturbances are also hitting the sector quite hard, especially for the exporting and importing countries. Today, all all these aspects of the supply chain from the bottling all the way to the shipping has been affected. And because of these problems, we can see that there are problems uh, for months to come. And today we are really seeing a kind of snowball effect. And as far as uh, the deceleration of the economy is concerned, it is affected, and the buying power of consumers has been affected as well. All of this, in fact, is leading to decreased demand, as we have seen earlier. And in this context, the sector has to be able to react. It's not just a question of wanting to return back to normal times. We will not go back to the past, and as a consequence, it's important to look at the future with imagination. And it's important that these general uh, data uh, take into account that global growth will offer certain opportunities because there is still a great deal of diversity of action. If I do not speak, we don't know if the translation issue has been solved. Uh, so I will go on speaking until someone actually tells me that uh, the translation is uh, working. So uh, is the translation working now? I see that uh, no one is telling me if the interpretation is working. Can anyone tell me if the interpretation is working? Can we uh, go on? Can we go on with the translation? Can we go on with the translation? One, two, three. Now, uh, changes in consumer preferences could also represent opportunities. Uh, in fact, uh, yes. Uh, there are opportunities. Uh, in the last few months, we've uh, seen inventory problems uh, in uh, Bordeaux, for example. Wineries have difficulties uh, selling their red wine, uh, uh, the low-end red wines, um, and uh, they ask for distillation as a support measure. A similar uh, problem, according to some observers, have been seen in other countries like Spain and Italy, uh, where the export uh, markets for red wines, uh, in fact, excluding, of course, premium and ultra-premium ones, have also met with difficulties in 2022. Now, uh, according to a study, in fact, done at the world level, 
and that was done in, uh, by the statistics department, uh, and it will be published uh, soon. We saw that red wines, in fact, are losing market share, while other categories like sparkling wines, rosé wines, uh, are increasing their market share. And uh, in fact, uh, let me give you some figures showing this. At the beginning of the century, red wines used to represent between 48 and 50 percent of uh, global production, while uh, white ones, in fact, uh, driven by the boom of sparkling wine, went up by 5 percent, and rosy wines, uh, in fact, uh, increased by 2 uh, percent. Now, here again, I think that uh, we can find opportunities. Uh, we can, uh, in fact, uh, show the resilience of the sector. Now, we have to change. We have to adapt uh, to the new generation of consumers uh, and the new climate conditions. Uh, in fact, uh, OIV will have to play an important role in this gradual but necessary transition. In this uh, framework, in fact, uh, I am happy to welcome the introduction of a category of products on the market that OIV is considering with great interest, de-alcoholized wines. We believe that there is an opportunity there. Big or small, we do not know. Now, uh, in any case, uh, what is essential for this new category of the uh, wine product is for the wine product, uh, in fact, as such, to maintain its integrity and not to be the industrial result of a formula or recipe. That is the real challenge for IV. De-alcoholized wine should be 100% wine, 100% agricultural, 100% single ingredient, uh, in fact. Now, looking at this and at things at a more institutional level, uh, there is a third challenge, uh, more abstract, in fact, that can have an impact um, on the real economy. And here I uh, refer to the questioning of the role of wine in our society, stemming from the concern of public health about alcoholic uh, beverages. Uh, now, uh, in fact, uh, Wine is an integral part of the food system. Uh, the world uh, of uh, vine and wine uh, is uh, playing an increasing role in the area of sustainability thanks to initiatives and actions linked to production, diversity, sustainable use, protection of biodiversity and natural uh, resources. When we look at the future, in fact, uh, 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 we must make sure that, uh, in fact, uh, the changes are positive. In fact, uh, we know that uh, vine and wine can play a sustainable role. It also supports, in fact, the rural communities. Um, now, I would also like... Uh, to say that uh, this year we are going to have the 44th uh, World Congress of uh, Vine and Wine. It will take place uh, between June 5 and uh, 9 in Jerez in Spain. Uh, this is the most important scientific event of the year for the world of vine and wine. And I'm especially proud to announce that the topic chosen by the organizers is extremely relevant today for all economic sectors, including the vine and wine sector. I'm referring to digitization. Now, uh, digitization helps us adapt to climate change. The objective of OIV is to, in fact, guarantee through governments a strong sector but uh, for that, we need to really understand uh, the support that can represent new technologies. And we have to make sure that the transition includes everyone and does not let 
anyone behind. I invite you all to Jerez, and I am sure that this Congress will be a step forward in the right direction. Thank you all for your attention, and I am now ready to answer any question you might have. start the Q&A session right now. I remind you that you can keep asking the questions on the chat and I will transmit them to the Director General. We've already received some of them. We'll start from China. Xu Meng, he wrote us, what do you mean by global supply chain disruptions when it comes to wine? Can you give us some examples, please? Mm. Okay, it all started in 2021 after the pandemic. And this is because the disruption caused by different rhythms of uh, unlocking or um, uh, the, the lockdown uh, in different countries provoked different uh, capacities uh, of reaction of, of mainly in sea freight in uh, different harbors. Uh, we have to think that uh, reduction of many goods is in some oriental countries. Consumption are mainly in occidental countries. So the, the, this circulation of goods was uh, heavily disrupted at that moment. Some examples for the sector maybe uh, for example, the ink, which is produced uh, for, for the supply of uh, printers, of labels. Imagine that uh, this, this is produced mainly in China, precisely, and uh, consumption is made where the printers are. So that, that's, that is significant because it's just a small example but it happens with many other things with supply. And urgency sometimes makes a force to higher prices. So the whole thing uh, became very difficult and still continues. And, you know, it, it's a problem uh, that is not solved overnight. It stays uh, for a while things, since it's, uh, solved. Guillaume from France. Guillaume de France nous pose une question sur la crise du vin rouge. Est-ce que c'est une tendance qu'on peut observer dans tous les pays ou est-ce que c'est juste, est juste un problème en France? But um, the figures that I presented were global, but of course, France. I think the figures were, I don't remember uh, at this moment, but in, in France, I think that this is almost 14%. So it's bigger than in other countries uh, and in Italy also. So this is mm, some big players are over ponderating the global figure. Concerning the same the same line of red wine, raise Emmanuel Danielou. Bonjour, Monsieur le Directeur Général. Vous avez... You have talked about resilience, imagination, and viticulture is to reinvent itself vis-à-vis -vis the drop of consumption in the area of red wine and uh, other products. Uh, as I said. The sector shows a lot of resilience. So uh, this means that the sector can adapt. It's not just changing things at the level of production, but it means that we can also try and influence the consumer. This being said, there are many possibilities of adapting, even with the, the red wine, 
uh, we uh, could also maybe produce uh, other wines with red wine. Red wines could be the basis for sparkling wines. I don't know. It is not for us to say uh, the innovations are in the hands of uh, the sector itself. Nika is asking about increase in prices in 2022. That is evident. What should we expect in 2023? Mm. As I said, um we have some the inflation keeps adding steps. Even if the next step is smaller than the, the one before, it's an ascension. It, it goes, it's crazy. Uh, I think uh, prices will not come back. And because also there is a tendency when of premiumization, a tendency of if I have to drink wine, which is the offer is more expensive, I better drink a better, a best, a better wine, or I change the offer. So this is it works both ways. Mm -hmm. So I drink less, I spend more. Mm -hmm. That's one tendency also. Mm -hmm. So I don't think what. Uh, there is a backwards tendency. Uh, we are away from the moments of big offer, low prices uh, because of the need. So this is not uh, probably the future of the sector. So prices, the idea is to remain stable, but uh, they might continue to grow for a couple of years. Thank you, Director General. We have a question, I presume, from Italy. Alessandra Biondi Bartolini. Do you have any data about consumption and market of new products and zero and low alcohol wines, which is known as NOLO? No. We only have estimations. And we work with very rigorous data normally. So we have to say we have no data. But at the same time, mm, analysts provide us with some guessings. And this market, presumably, is very um, big, if uh, or at least significant. Mm? But now it's negligible. negligible. Um, the, our aim is to universalize wine. And if we don't have uh, this alternative, I think we won't get to universalization of wine. So that's the message. I have a question from the Southern Hemisphere, Carlos from Chile. This is the fourth year in a row of low production. What will be the consequences on the market? It's not that low. I mean, uh, 258 million hectoliters uh, compared to an average of 270 million hectoliters, it's almost uh, the average. Um, and, and also, you have to consider that uh, the tendency of consumption seems to be stable or going down a little bit. So mm, there is not mismatching between offer and demand. Natasha, Natasha from, from Oregon, Oregon in the United States. What are you doing at the OIB about de alcoholized wines? And what do you think about its market expansion? About what wines? De alcoholized, de -alcoholized wines. wines. In the OIV, we try to be to maintain tradition at the same time that we innovate. Uh, this is the, the equilibrium and also the way to evolve. Mm -hmm. But at, this, at the same time, I think the demand of um, no-lows 
this has to be a very integrated uh, product, and pro a product that is 100% wine. And this is, uh, this is what we are working. It's a difficult uh, innovation, but we have we we cannot admit mixtures and making uh, recipes of different ingredients. No, the consumer wants wine and they want it de de alcoholized, but they don't. They they want wine. They don't want to be cheated. So we have to ensure that wine is properly de alcoholized, so as to get to a de alcoholized wine. Uh, and this is very important. This is very important. And this is a challenge. It's a very technological challenge, but it needs to be 100% made by, the, by a farmer that produced the wine, and it needs to, be, needs to preserve uh, most of the characteristics of the original wine. The, the next, next question, question is from, from Angelica Sobotina. Hello, and thank you very much for the conference and the possibility to communicate with the OIB. As far as wine tourism is concerned, how is it possible to estimate it in numbers and what destination has become most popular for the wine tourists? Um, the specialist here is uh, the head of the statistics department. Uh, Giorgio Del Grosso that has participated in a working group of experts in the W, uh, the, the United Nations Agency on Tourism, okay, the WTO, no? World Tourism Organization. So you have the floor. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Director General, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So. Uh, to answer uh, the question uh, of this journalist, yes, it is indeed possible to, to estimate uh, wine tourism in numbers. However, there are uh, um, some issues, uh, the main one being that many countries uh, employ a different methodology when it comes to uh, measurement of wine tourism. And therefore, it is extremely difficult to compare or aggregate uh, such data. Uh, and this is the reason why uh, the OAV and the UNWTO, the World Tourism Organization, uh, are working together uh, to develop a common methodological framework to measure the wine tourism phenomenon. And uh, I think we will be able to uh, publish a report on this by the end of the year. Thank you. We have... Another, another question. question. Thank, Thank you, Giorgio. Giorgio. We'll have another, another question from Lorena Meloni from Enolife. This is one, one is in Spanish. Spanish. ¿Cómo ¿Cómo es el crecimiento del con... A question concerning premium wines. Now. It's difficult to know where this segment starts and ends. Uh, and premium wines, uh, and uh, you know, uh, do not represent the same in the different uh, countries. Uh, so it is difficult to have precise data. But we have trends. We see an increase in the price of all wines. And Therefore, either, you know, uh, the consumers will stop looking, uh, drinking wine, or they will go for higher price wines, or they will pay the same price and get a lower quantity uh, uh, or a lower quality wine. But this means many, many possibilities. The demand is an active demand, but there are different different solutions, and this is this is great because it makes it possible for you to adapt, and you can also go on offering what you were offering and also uh, offer something else to the other customers. 
So anyway, there is a trend towards premium wines. There are also wines uh, that undergo an increase in price, even though the quality of the wine does not uh, in increase. So very different situations. We have a question in French. Anne-Marie, la semaine dernière. Last week, we have read that France supports China asking to become a member of OIV. Can you make a comment on that? Well, this was uh, the conclusion of the meeting between the French president and the uh, Chinese uh, uh, authorities. But what I can say is that we are very happy uh, and we uh, deeply thank France and the European Union because the European Union also went to Beijing. Um, so we thank them for supporting uh, this idea of widening OIV, because you know that uh, OIV welcomes all members. Uh, China is a very important uh, player in our sector. So uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, welcoming uh, China with the uh, open arms, of course, uh, there is a process to follow that it, c it can take uh, some time, but we will make our utmost uh, to, uh, you know, speed up things if uh, this uh, uh, desire, uh, in fact, becomes a reality. Questions that have not been answered, they're going to be answered uh, via email. You can just forward me the question that you have, and then I will share it with the statistics department. Let's go to this final question from Manuel from Portugal. Manuel, Portugal has significantly increased its wine consumption in 2022. How is that possible? Well, um, the increase is because the, there has been an increase in consumption. If you are saying about the, something about the increase in per capita consumption, I also I also uh, give you gave you before some um, preliminary. Uh, aspects on that need to be taken into account. Uh, but in, concerning the lack of data on, so we have some data, but we don't have the breakdown of some qualitative aspects that are very important. But in Portugal, what is, is important is the importance of touring to, uh, to the normal population. So uh, tourism is uh, a big factor of changing uh, this uh, figure. Um, so I imagine that last year was a record in uh, movement of tourism in Portugal, but we don't have the data either. Okay, but that was, but that's what it, we can interpret because and we all know that uh, what we see around, and I am Spanish, and and I see uh, everybody going to spend the the uh, to spend the weekends in Porto and and Lisbon. So I imagine that this is a big factor playing there. Are there other questions? That was the final one. Thank, Thank you, you, Director General. We'll keep going to Portugal all, all together. together.
Thank you very much to all for attending to this press conference. Uh, as I said before, you can send your questions, all the questions that haven't been answered. We are sorry, but we don't have the time to answer all of them. We will answer them properly from the statistical department and other departments from the OIB, whatever the question is. Remember, you can send them all to my press email, which is press at oib.int, and we will, as I said, answer them. Thanks for following. Follow us on social media, and I'll see you in the Congress in Jerez de la Frontera in Spain. Bye-bye. Have a good afternoon and a good morning.